Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's webcast, we're separating the hype about artificial intelligence from the practical reality. We're talking about the top generative AI use cases that are providing real-world value for business users. And we'll discuss the future of generative AI and how businesses can prepare for that right now. To discuss that, I'm joined by a leading voice in the field. With me is Muhammad Ali, Senior Vice President of IBM Consulting. Muhammad, I thank you so much for joining us today. James, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. So I think there's a, a certain amount of confusion out in the, in the business community. You know, managers are very excited about AI. They want to get on board or, or get more on board, mm -hmm. but they're not sure how to do it. I think maybe it's magic. We, we bring in the AI, we sprinkle it over the software, it makes everything okay. Although maybe they, they, they realize that doesn't quite work. If you get practical, right, what, what do you think about you know, the top generative AI use cases that are driving real business value for, for actual real world clients? Yeah, I mean, James, you're right. There's so much excitement over this technology. I, mean, I don't know about you, but you know, in my career, I don't think I've ever seen so much investment go into a single technology so fast. So never, have, never. Right? I know what you mean, exactly, right. Yeah. Tons and tons of excitement. And, you know, I think in the consumer space, I mean, we're also excited playing with it to, you know, write emails, write poetry, plan a vacation. But, you know, for businesses, it's sort of not a game. You've got to get it right. And, uh, and I think that's where the challenge uh, starts, right? Like, how do you pick the thing to focus on and then how do you get it right? Mm -hmm. You know, someone said to me, um, they were talking about the, the strategy that some businesses use. They say, well, you know, we're going to go for the low hanging flute, uh, fruit first, the, yeah. the, the easy stuff. Other, and then this executive said to me, no, no, don't do that because sure, it'll be easy, but it won't really drive much value. So go ahead and, and be, you know, go towards the ambitious project right off the bat so people can yeah. point to it and go, hey, this really counted for us. I mean, do you have an opinion on that issue? I do. I have a very strong opinion on this issue. Oh, good. So, you know, after I graduated from college, which was on your side of the world there, mm. I actually helped start a neural network company. This is back in the early 90s. Oh. And I remember like one of the first things that we tried to do was try, try to diagnose medical condition. And that is a really, really hard problem. But, the, but it turned out that there were actually a lot easier problems that we could solve much quicker and much easier with neural networks. Hmm. And the same thing exists today. You know, a few weeks ago, I was with the CEO of a large energy company, you know, very large energy company. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, listen, you know, if you could help us predict the weather, we can station our, our equipment in the right place when a storm happens wow. and I say, really, that is an extraordinarily hard problem. I don't right. think that's where we should start. Right. Where I think we should start is you have all these customers calling it and they have all kinds of problems. And guess what? Generative AI is extraordinarily good at parsing through all kinds of uh, documents and coming up with the answers for your, for your customers. And it turns out that if you look at, you know, we've done about a thousand of these generative AI projects uh, over the last year or so. And one of the things that we're noticing is that, in fact, the low hanging fruit has a lot of opportunity. So mm. customer service is one of the top three areas where we see our projects driving the most value. Mm. The other being coding, right? Like writing code, um, because well, it has to be very text-based and you know you, you can you know generative AI is very good at text things, mm -hmm. and then other areas of, of uh, what we call employee productivity, and you know I, I can go into some of that. But I think those are three areas of low hanging fruit that have tremendous benefit, like mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40 percent productivity gains, right there. Right. Okay. So you you do believe in the in the value of the low hanging fruit? It makes a lot of sense. I do. Yeah. I do. Yes. You know, I, interesting, I don't know what my question is here, but I think it's interesting, you know, AI is both a consumer and an enterprise technology. So I see yeah. friends, you know, searching for businesses using, we, we searched for a bike route over, over the weekend, actually chat mm -hmm. helped us and, you know, people yeah. are using it to write things. So it's, right. it's, it's remarkable. It's not, I think the adoption rate is really quite rapid. It's not like it it's is. just, people are, people are into it. Yeah. I mean, it is one of the fastest technologies that have gotten adopted, right? I mean, if you think about it, the internet took a while, cloud took a while, the mobile phone took a while. 
in 18 months and everybody it seems like everybody on the planet is using it i mean i you know i was going to london with my daughter and we used it to plan the trip uh mm. around the things that she's interested in um so yeah i mean the adoption has just been incredible uh, mm. but you know the consumer space um a little bit slower in the enterprise space for the reasons i described but even in the enterprise space i mean every ceo realized that they have to lean in, otherwise they might get left behind. So the adoption is quite incredible. Well, all right, talking about that low hanging fruit. So I know that some businesses have started small with AI, but they want to develop their deployment. What about some strategies for scaling AI across the enterprise and, and driving adoption? That seems like it's, it's a big issue. Yes, so we have seen a lot of this because like I said, we've now, you know, our consulting business, we're about 160,000 consultants. So we see a lot of projects. And like I said, we've seen about a thousand of these projects. Hmm. Uh, some of them we've done, some of them we've been brought in after the fact. And, and the after the fact is interesting because client will do a proof of concept. It works. It works really great. We're ready to scale it. Then all of a sudden they'll realize, hey, we forgot to secure this thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? yeah, so we, right. didn't, we didn't put the right governance around it. So we have to kind of sort of take a step back, go figure out those governance mechanism because, well, for one thing, you have to make sure they're secure, right? They're new, they're new things that we didn't, we didn't have before, like prompt injection. So when you issue a prompt and it calls an, an LLM, how do you know something isn't intercepting it one direction mm -hmm. or the other direction? Mm -hmm. So people are doing this. So you actually have to deploy security to prevent that. So there's a whole set of new attack vectors on AI, right? So first thing you have to secure it. Second is you've got to figure out, well, is there personal information being passed around here? Is it creating biases, right? Is it infringing in other people's intellectual property? Hmm. How much is it costing every time I do one of these uh, uh, call, prom calls? If I have 10,000 call center agents, you know, is it going to cost me tens of millions of dollars to run this thing? Right. So you've got to put a governance framework in place. And so we often help clients sort of back up, put the governance framework in place, then put the, the, the generative AI technology, you know, tools in place so they can they can consume it. So yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of starting small, but in order to scale, you know, you've got to put those foundational items in place. And then the second piece about cost is really important. So I was with a a, a, a customer that earlier this week. And this customer is a very, very, very large um, uh, uh, customer service provider, let's say. You, James, I'm sure, have used their service many, yes. many times. Yes, okay. <laughs> and so I bet, yeah. The guy said to me, look, I have 10,000 agents, and we built these, these L you know, we have this LM, and this prompt calls it, and it's consuming all this. It, it's very expensive. It's consuming all these tokens, is what they're called. And right. we can't run it. So what we've done is we've created a kind of a new interim thing called prompt caching. So if hmm. you're going to ask this thing the same question, it doesn't go to the LLM, which consumes, you know, oh. costly. It, it, it knows that somebody else asked the same question and they response. So all kinds of techniques now are coming into existence to manage costs. So in order to scale, I think there are two big things, right? There's governance. And then how do you manage costs as you, as you, uh, as you expand usage? You know, it's really interesting about the prompt caching. It makes perfect sense. And it seems like if, if 500 agents have asked that one question, we don't really need to bother the LLM itself for, for the answer. That The answer is right there in front of us. We don't need to like, incur yeah, the cost I mean, of the LLM. I, I think we just hit it on a new startup company. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Pro, acting line. Promptcaching.com. Let's start it. I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll, I'll contact Andres and Horowitz and we'll get funded by the end of the week. No doubt about That's it. That's right. You and me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to go back to something you said. I thought that was really interesting in that um, you talk about intercepting the prompt between, I guess, the, 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 the software and the LLM that is feeding into it. Mm -hmm. I always thought, I mean, just for my education, I thought there was like sort of a pretty clear cut API path there that probably would not be, be intercepted. But am I wrong about that? Is, that? is that a possible interception point there? Yeah, this is a real thing. And luckily, there's now soft, there's security software to actually um, uh, you know, track for that, right? So mm -hmm. we actually, in our implementation within our organization, we um, use a product called Polar Security. 
and Polar Security allows us to do prompt injection checking, right? And so, um, and James, just to give you a sense, within consulting, we are big users of, uh, of generative AI as, as tools, right? As, as sort of digital worker tools to, to mm -hmm. aid our consultants. So our vision is, um, and we're, we're sort of on this path already, is for every of our consultants, they have 10 agents that are helping them. Oh, okay. So 60,000 consultants, you have 1.6 million digital workers. Wow, so okay. we actually have to build a governance platform with security so that as they use these agents, it they help them and these agents are calling LLMs, this is a secure environment. So by building it for ourselves, you know, we're also able to advise our clients on how they should do. You know, that that is really also quite fascinating. So there's 60,000 consultants, they each have 10 agents. I guess I'm curious, I mean, I know 10 is an arbitrary number, it could be eight, could be 11, I, I, I'm assuming, but I mean, it seems like they would not need that many in that you is there not a like like yeah, a, a versatile handful of a five? I mean, you tell me. Right, right, right. So this is interesting, right? So it's 160,000 consultants, and that's why we sort of came up with this 1.6 million. Okay, yeah. All right. And so you're right, it doesn't have to be 10, right? So we just sort of picked the number that, that we, we thought sort of made sense because right. today, in fact, when you use Chat GPT, you're using one at a time, right? You right. ask a question, it's coming back. Right. And this is this is what we call assistance in the in sort of the, the AI world. Sure. But that's recently changed and it's moved to these things called agents. So an assistant, you ask it, it responds. If it doesn't know the answer, it tells you it doesn't know the answer. Right. An agent is different. An agent, you ask it a question and it says, Hey James, I don't I don't know the answer, but do you mind if I send an email to your colleague, uh, Anne, and ask Anne if she knows the answer, mm -hmm. sure. So then the agent goes off and it's, it's doing that. And it could be doing multiple things while you wait for that agent to come back. Right. And that agent could be slow because it's not just compute. It's waiting on another human being. Right. And, okay. And so you launch that agent and then you're, you know, then you want to, you're doing something else. You okay. launch another agent and you launch another agent. And we believe that they will come, it won't be that long where we're launching many agents and so we just picked the number we say said 10. so we wanted to build you know a, a, a governance layer but not just a governance layer a compute infrastructure under, underneath that would not be that, that would be cost efficient to run even at that scale at 1.6 million digital workers because right now with a compute infrastructure that exists we will actually not be able to afford 1.6 million digital workers. So uh, by having that vision, that's where we need to end up. It allows us to then architect our internal platform such that we can get there. And so, yes, yeah, so whether it's eight or 10 or 12, it's, you know, it's less important, but this concept that, you know, you as an individual will have multiple agents working for you simultaneously is where is, is where actually the technology is today. All right. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I, I know there's a startup here in the Bay Area that is working or has, has already achieved the idea of, the, of a very functioning agent where I say you want to buy a refrigerator, the agent will go price the refrigerators, they'll make the decision, they'll, they'll work on getting it, you know, into your house, they'll, they're really, it's, it's, a fi it's yeah. willing to do five or six, seven, eight steps while you just wait for the refrigerator to show up. So yeah. I guess that's really what you're talking about in terms of the agent. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know, James, if you got a chance to go to Dreamforce. Um, not this year. I go, I go most years, but not this year. Yeah, it was incredible. The whole thing was about Salesforce's agent force, uh -huh. right? How it's really all about the agents going forward, mm. and um, and in some ways, uh, you know, Salesforce is a very close partner to us at IBM, right. and many of the uh, uh, technologies that they're bringing to market. Um, we have a joint uh, relationship with, we are powering it with some of our technologies. Um, we are, um, you know, helping them deploy this in the field. But, um, but, but Dreamforce was fascinating because it was almost 100% about agents. Mm. Uh, they were literally like, uh, uh, you know, costumed uh, characters 
that look oh. like it's walking around right okay. and so um you know it's it's not just us it's salesforce is actually uh i mean i think within the next 12 months you know the the the, the industry will migrate to agents well i guess it's so if i see someone using chat gpt i could say hey that's an assistant that is so 2023. I'm into agents myself. I'm into 2025. So I can sort of look down on them because I'm into agents, not assistants. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sort of the, the agents sort of live on top, right? So, you know, yeah. chat GPT is an assistant application in some ways that live on top of the LLM, right? So the, the LLMs will evolve on their own, right, at their own pace. But the things that live on top are becoming more sophisticated. And, I'm, you know, I'm sure there will be the agent version of ChatGPT and there'll be the agent version of, you know, everybody's uh, uh, AI product out there. Right, right. You know, you've talked a little about this, but I think it's important. I want to make sure we get back to this. You know, what, what do you think about it? critical considerations for cybersecurity and AI governance in an open approach? What, what, what do managers need to know? And I know you did touch on that a little bit. I just want to make sure I get your full thoughts on that one. Yeah. So, look, you know, we, we talked a little bit about cybersecurity and how important it is, right? And so, um, you, you know, we, we've done some studies and, um, you know, 75% of CEOs out there and CXOs believe that they, you know, they have no choice but to move towards generative AI to increase their productivity of their companies. Right. But, less than 40% of them believe that they have the security in place to do that. Oh. Now, which is interesting because nonetheless, they're going, because if they don't, their competitors will, right? right. So it's almost right. an existential threat. So, um, so, so core security is really important. But long-term, uh, you, know, you sort of mentioned this word open. We believe open is really important because when you, when you have um, uh, uh, neural network models where you don't understand what's in these models, and they're locked down, it's, it's actually hard to know how to secure them, either, you know, kind of core types of security or, um, you know, things like hallucinations. You just don't know what's in there. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a whole wave of companies, including Meta, IBM, and others that have been bringing open models to market where, you know, you know what's inside you know what the weights are, you even know how the data, you know, what data is used for training it. And so visibility throughout that, that, um, that sort of supply chain that builds the, the AI technology, mm -hmm. we think is really important if, if you're going to have, you know, a good shot at securing these things well. D does, you said, does, does the open format make it more challenging or, or le less challenging? I want to make sure I'm we clear think on it that. Makes we think it makes it more secure because there are more people really looking at it and understand where where the where the faults are, right? So that and there are more people building solutions to protect against those you know those points of exposure. Sort of you know more eyes on the problem. Um, we think creates a, a you know, more secure environment. Yeah, makes makes perfect sense. Um, well, I want to get your sense of the future, where we're going in the future, because I think that's that's really the, the big, big question in this topic. So I guess, A, what, what, what do you think about the, the transformative effect on generative AI on, on the consulting industry? Let's, let's touch on that, and then we we'll yeah. get to the future. But generative AI and, and consulting going forward, what, what, what is your sense of that? Yeah, I mean, we, we think that it's going to have a massive impact on the consulting industry. And so, uh, you know, as... Um, as I, I, I mentioned to you before the call, I, I rejoined IBM about a year ago. And mm -hmm. uh, and before that, 14 years ago, I, I worked at IBM and I got a chance to work on many of the software products. Mm. And so, you know, part of the reason I rejoined is because I saw this opportunity for significant change. And it's exciting. Uh, I mean, it's it's a little bit, you know, there's some trepidation in how right. you go through this. Um, but, but with this level of productivity, I think we'll be able to do you know, so much more than we ever could before. And, and I think there's going to be actually more demand for mm. what we do. Mm -hmm. So you know, the type of IT projects that you might have not done before and accumulated a lot of technical debt, the fact that now we can do those projects quicker, faster, lower costs, people are going to deploy their IT budgets to do those things that they weren't doing before. And so 
but in order to do that, you know, consulting companies are going to need to deploy these digital workers to and these agents to support their consultants to work more efficiently. And it's a big part of why, you know, instead of us just sort of adopting generative AI in kind of a raw sense, we went out and we built a whole platform. Hmm. Platform that provides the governance, the security, um, and we call it IBM Consulting Advantage. It's an internal okay. platform. We're on our right. third release of it. And, um, and it allows us to build these thousands of agents on top of it and then align those agents to our particular consultants so that you know they're getting they're getting agents that matter to them. So like you, James, as a reporter, you'll get a pack of, you know, say 10 agents that are specific to you and what you do. So right. we're investing heavily in it. We're also have, investing heavily on skills development of our team members in order to take advantage of this. But yeah, I, I believe there's gonna be a significant transformation in the consulting industry. And uh, you know, the companies that invest in this type of approach are gonna be one, the ones that are successful. Interesting, Re really interesting. And I love the idea of the agents and, and each of the consultants having multiple agents. That, that is fascinating. But I think as a, as a closing question about the future of business, I, I think um, one of the problems with that question is that AI, AI has so much potential, but there's really, it's hard to know exactly where it's going. I think even some of the smartest minds don't know exactly where it's going because it's going to develop exponentially and it has the ability to develop by itself to a certain extent. I mean, it's one of the only technologies, maybe the only technology that humankind has ever created that can you know, develop by itself to a certain extent. Uh, so I guess I'd ask you, what is what, what is your sense of the future of Gen AI in business? And that is as part of that, does something, anything worry you about that? What, what, yeah. What's your worry and what, what do you see as the future? So James, very good question. So I think there, there are multiple paths to Gen AI, right? So there's the consumer path, which uh, uh, will have sort of its own uh, trajectory. And then there's the business path. And I think in businesses, uh, businesses are going to be much, much more careful about how they deploy Gen AI mm. because they can't afford for it to go wrong. Like right. It could be destructive to your company. And so this is a big part of why we built that IBM Consulting Advantage platform, which is an internal platform for ourselves, because we need to ensure that how uh, generative AI is, is used is well-governed according to good policies. And we are, uh, you know, sort of, uh, containing it and in, in a way that allows it to be productive for us, but, um, you know, but, but not do things we don't want it to do. Mm -hmm. Not sure that's going to be the case always in the consumer world, right? Because right. the consumer world moves faster um, in, in some ways. It, um, it, you know, it's a proliferation of uh, potentially smaller uh, uh, entities that sort of do what they do. Mm -hmm. In businesses, we you know, we can't afford to do that, right? Because one error and, you know, it, it can affect the business dramatically. And in some ways, you know, for us at IBM, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of in, in some ways uniquely positioned, right? For, for many, many decades, you know, I, IBM has taken a very measured approach to technology, you know, ensure that there's trust around technology and, you um, and you know, in, we are the only consulting company with a full technology company inside of this. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so we have the ability to sort of think about how to balance these things and also think about it long term. I'm not sure, you know, everyone is necessarily going to take that approach, but that is the approach that we're taking, and that's the approach we're taking for our clients. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, Mohammed, I think you said it. Uh, fascinating, and, and thank you so much for sharing your expertise today. Uh, please come back and talk with us again sometime. James, it was, a, it was a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much.